folks that are joining us online. So thank you for that. Um, today, we're going to continue with the third of three uh, public forums that we've scheduled. Um, we did one on budget. Um, this past Friday, we did our economic vitality forum on Monday. And then today, we have the two amazing experts from community development, Ms. Anna Bertanzetti, who is our planning director and co-director of community development, and then Katie Allen, our city and county, county engineer, who I always tease, I try to sit as close to as possible to just absorb all the stuff she does. So it's really nice to have both of them here today. Um, kind of, you know, we've done these in a very methodical way, the budget kind of kicking us off, talking about development and the economy um, on Monday, and now kind of closing that loop with community development and planning and engineering. So um, much of what Anna and Katie do is completely around making sure that we are being thoughtful and being mindful of the things that we're building in Broomfield. So I know from Anna, I've learned a lot about what a concept review is and what it's not. Um, concept review is a very high level conceptual um, uh, reviews that come to council. They're kind of just to talk about, hey, does this really feel like this is what we want to do with our 34, almost 34 square miles um, that we have remaining? So concept review is kind of that kickoff before the developers kind of decide, hey, yeah, we got great feedback, or ooh, I'm not sure if this is the right place for that, before they actually go through the actual development review process. So, of course, Anna will talk more in detail about that, but I just want to say that I appreciate them and just the collaboration I see between Anna and Katie, as well as Jeff Rodeline, um, who is the master of all things. I just call him the master of the universe because he just walked in. Um, as well as our finance. I mean, we truly do work in a very collaborative way as a city and county team to make sure that we are doing what's best for the community as we move into the future. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and invite Anna is going to kick us off. So everybody, Anna Burton Zetti. Abby. So um, we have a few things that we wanted to cover today with the uh, Forum on Community Development. We're going to start with um, what we should start with, which is our mission. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, how what we do fits in with the goals and priorities for the city council and for the city as a whole. Um, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the development review process and do a very high level, what is that process? How do we engage with the public? Um, how does city council um, interact with that process? Um, and then we're going to very briefly, very high level, talk about some trends that we're seeing in our development proposals. Um, so with that, we'll start the presentation. If we can have the next slide. A few years ago, um, the division directors for community development got together and we wanted to revisit our mission statement. And this is how we settled on, or this is what we settled on because this is what we felt really captured why it is that we do what we, what we do and, and what we're trying to achieve um, on a daily basis with what we do. Oh, thank you. Uh, so community development will improve quality of life and make Brimfield a better place to live, work, play, and stay by fulfilling the community's vision. So the community's vision is what's outlined in the comprehensive plan. That's um, a citizen-driven document. It's updated every 10 years. It's adopted by the city council. And the community's vision is also how we, what we hear when we engage with the public. It's also um, what the city council decides are their priorities on a yearly basis. Um, and, and really what we, you're gonna hear about transportation, traffic, capital projects, building safety. Um, that's what's gonna make people have a good quality of life um, and really make people wanna do all these things, live, work, play, and stay. Next slide, please. So community development is made up of multiple divisions. We have engineering, transportation and traffic, capital improvements, building, planning, and administration. Katie and I um, both co-direct the department, but we separate these divisions and kind of take a leading role in the divisions. So if we look at the next slide, um, these are the three teams that um, I take a priority in leading, the building safety, planning, and administrative team. So keeping with building safety first, um, this is where we are issuing building permits, doing building inspections, um, reviewing building plans against the building code. This is all the internal functions of building safety, structure, plumbing, mechanical, um, and also looking um, 
whether it's a, a deck permit or looking at a multi-story building in interlock um, this is life safety reviews. The planning division is reviewing development proposals. Um, re we review this against development standards that are in the municipal code in various zoning documents. You'll hear us talk a lot about planned unit development plans, which are custom zoning documents. Burnfield has a lot of PUD plans. We do a lot of customized zoning. Um, and we also uh, look uh, to play a big role in um, engaging with the comprehensive plan for Burnfield. And then the administrative division is really the backbone for all of our community development staff. Um, and this is a separate division within community development because we feel it's important for that cross training um, and to have experts that can help all of our divisions with records retention, with our memorandum review process, um, with public records requests, grants administration. Um, these are all important elements where we have experts that are able to help all of the divisions together, um, although there are administrative members that um, primarily are assigned to particular divisions. With that, I will introduce Katie, um, and hopefully she'll remember to use the clicker. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Katie Allen. I'm a city and county engineer. And as Anna said, I uh, co direct community development with her. And the divisions that I oversee are um, the engineering division, uh, transportation and traffic, as well as the capital improvements program or CIP. So, our CIP division, they are a group of professional project managers. We build uh, city funded projects of all types. So, uh, roadways, <coughs> utility projects, drainage improvements, parks and recreation projects, new buildings, building remodels. So pretty much uh, all capital projects um, are under our group. Um, and maintenance is not, but we work closely with our public works on, on several um, crossover projects. Our engineering uh, division is sort of similar to the building safety division. They, we, the engineering develops criteria for roadways and utilities and drainage systems and, and things like that. And we do the review for developers um, where the building department is looking at the building plans themselves. We are looking at the infrastructure and the site work. We also do right-of-way permitting. So um, any work that's done in a right-of-way by private entities like cable companies and telephone and cell energy as well as um, homeowners doing sidewalk repairs or driveway cuts or um, um, you know, sanitary sewer and water uh, upgrades. Um, all those permits come through our engineering staff for review. We also do an inspection of, of all those improvements out in the field. Um, transportation and traffic. Traffic engineering is probably what most people are familiar with. Um, monitoring our traffic systems or signals responding to resident concerns, um, putting in recommendations for any changes to the traffic system. Um, transportation is looking more term or longer term at um, our, our overall vision and how, how we go about providing a well-connected and well-maintained multimodal uh, transportation system that works for all modes. So that's all types of transportation, whether it's uh, auto automobiles, pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, rail, freight, all those things. Um, we are working on and we um, work extensively with other entities, whether it's the Department of Transportation or RTD or um, Denver Regional Council of Governments or uh, adjoining uh, local governments. Um, yeah. That's the slide. So um, the way community development supports the community um, is summarized on this slide, it's a little wordy, but so the planning, building, and engineering divisions work with developers to ensure economic vitality, to advance infrastructure, and to encourage incorporating affordable and attainable housing into residential developments. The transportation division participates in regional transportation collaborations and partnerships with stakeholders to identify legislative and funding opportunities that would benefit from the building. The CIP division uh, implements the multimodal transportation or utility system improvements, building and efficiency improvements, key infrastructure uh, that in turn supports economic vitality and group as a whole. 
Um, as far as council priorities, um, as we mentioned, we are we are focusing on transportation and how to secure additional funding for those transportation goals. Um, and we are we've been lately we've been implementing a development review process updates, which include two new advisory boards, the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment and the Land Use Review Commission, to help streamline uh, the development review process for um, smaller projects and for individual property owners. Um, how we as a department support the rest of the organization, um, we provide information to internal and external stakeholders regarding development projects. Uh, we coordinate uh, the review process for some of our uh, big important projects, such as the Broomfield Town Square or the Flatiron Crossing Redevelopment. Uh, each year we work with finance to um, establish a five-year capital improvement program budget. Um, and as mentioned, we design and construct those improvements for public works as well as other departments um, who are the end users of those projects. Um, we support, we, we are the staff support for council on um, regional transportation boards and committees. And we are also the staff uh, support for the Land Use Review Commission, the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment, the Historical Landmark Board, and the Broomfield County Transportation Forum. All right, so for 2022, some of our key initiatives for this department um, to collaborate with other departments through the matrix team, which I, um, I'm guessing you've heard of um, with the economic development. Um, so that, that matrix team is staffed from economic vitality, community development, the attorney's office, and finance to coordinate um, some of these more complex uh, development projects such as Greenfield Town, Squ uh, Town Square and the Flatiron Crossing Redevelopment, as well as Baseline. Um, and also for 2022, uh, we will be training for the new board and commission members and implementing new development process uh, related to the creation of the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment and the Land Use Review Commission. This uh, slide, we touch on some of our projects that we are working on now and will continue to work on in 2022. We have some major utility system projects, particularly in the water fund. Um, we are starting uh, design on um, additional water tanks for the northeast area part of Broomfield, as well as a pump station. In that same location, we're working on the design for a water tank for our river's water. Um, we are working on a pump station to deliver water from the Siena Reservoir to our water plant. And the Mesa Zone booster station is, provides redundancy for our higher pressure zones near the Milwaukee Airport. There's several grant funded transportation projects underway um, with different pots of money. Um, we are working on bike and ride shelters at our um, uh, two RTD um, bus stations. Um, bike and pedestrian wayfinding um, is a um, design project underway. We are evaluating Midway Boulevard all the way through town um, as a multimodal corridor and, and to identify what improvements are needed where along that roadway. Um, we have additional funds to improve 112th Avenue between um, approximately if you're familiar with Jefferson Academy, so just uh, west of Main Street to uh, the Arista uh, subdivision. We are working with the Department of Transportation to look at the US 287 corridor um, to improve access by um, filling in sidewalk gaps and, and transit stop access points. And we have funds to do a connection from uh, the New State Highway 20, 128 connection to the US 36 bikeway. Um, we are working on industrial lane uh, biking pet improvements. We have the first phase is the east half of industrial lane, and that will go out to bid soon for construction in 2022. We're starting design on the west half, which we call phase two. And um, also in the same area, we are starting design on improvements of the uh, Turkey intersection at Nickel Industrial Lane and Palmer Street. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, sorry. Um, are all of these outlined in a specific location so we can go look and see like where the Mesa zone is or the you know, reservoir pump station? 
So probably the, the easiest thing to do is if you get to the capital improvement program website, we actually have a map that shows all the projects. And we have a symbol that corresponds with a type of project. So the water project should be one symbol and transportation a different one. And so that's probably the best way to figure out where these are. Back to Anna. Katie, I have a question okay. too. Um, this is just kind of being around town for a while with the redevelopment at the mall. And there was the expansive soils issues and you know, some pretty serious structural concerns. Um, how involved does the city and county get and how much is just developer responsibility when it comes to stuff like that? It's like, you know, it's a it's a regional problem, right? But it's something that we already know could be an issue. So I'm just kind of wondering how how deep into kind of details like that you all get. For our roadways, I would say we spent several years, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, you know, looking at our roadways, um, particularly the inner walk and the flatiron crossing area where the soils are particularly expansive. We changed our process for roadway design. One of the key things that we've done is that um, prior they used to get soils, test information, and they put together a design. And then if there was significant grading would happen, that's new soil, right? It's been it's either the same soil that's been changed and modified, um, or it's been imported. So now what we do is, is once they hit a certain level of grading, that's when they take the soils test, and that's when they put together the design. And then we've also changed our sections. We've got a drainage requirement since that time. So um, for the public infrastructure, we've really focused on that. When it comes to buildings, um, that I mean, Anna can talk maybe a little bit more about that, but that is really on. I mean, we have we have certain requirements based on high expansive soils versus low expansive, but but the actual foundation designs and things like that, the buildings are put on the structural engineer um, to make sure they have the right for that building. Oh, sorry, I saw you creeping down there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I for those that don't know, I mean, I'm David Allen, I'm one of two assistant city county managers, and with the the mall redevelopment project, because there was that past history with the building foundations. Um, when we've had conversations with uh, Maestrich, um, they are planning to do um, structural uh, foundations, if you will, for, for, for the new construction that they're going to build out there. So they won't run into the same type of, of foundational issues with the new buildings. So, thanks. Thank you. So we wanted to provide a quick overview of our development process um, because it's a lot of what we do in community development. So um, just really high level, these are six pretty typical applications um, that are typically seen by the public, um, city council, and our commissions. Um, planned unit developments, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, are some customized zoning documents. So what this does is it allows a particular piece of property to have unique standards. Um, one area of town, it may be appropriate to have really high buildings and higher densities. That may not be appropriate everywhere. And there may be some areas where we want to do something really unique, like a cluster development, or um, if someone were to propose tiny houses, that's how you achieve this. You go through a customized zoning process. We have a lot of PUDs. Most of our larger neighborhoods, Wildgrass, Anthem, Broadlands, all have unique standards that were developed specifically for those neighborhoods. Site development plans take those standards and refine them further. So this is more specific to the street layouts, the street um, landscaping and design, the architecture, um, the amenities that would be um, in a neighborhood if it was a residential project, um, or if it's a subject or it's a, it's a shopping center. This is the overall layout specific to the parking ratios, uh, the building standard signage. Um, all of those elements get very quickly re refined in a site development plan. A subdivision plat is the subdivision of land. So we do minor subdivisions if someone is just looking to subdivide a large piece of acreage into two pieces, um, or some complex subdivisions for uh, like a neighborhood would be a more complex final. Um, a use by special review is when a, a use is identified by zoning as potentially appropriate for an area, but a special review is needed. So this is often things like a gas station or um, daycare centers, 
dog uh, kennels. Some it might be appropriate in like a business district, but we want to see the specifics. Does it have um, outdoor dog runs next to a residential area? We want to see the details, and so it may be appropriate, but we want to see the details through this public process. Um, rezoning is the process that we do to establish new zoning for a piece of property. All, all property was zoned when it was annexed, um, but as we see redevelopment occur, um, often there is a, a request for a rezoning. Um, and the concept reviews, like Abby mentioned, that's really the start of our public process. Um, so this is a developer's opportunity to present a proposal and get initial feedback, but no decision is made. Sometimes it's very preliminary, and sometimes it is um, pretty well thought out and, and looks like a very final plan, but again, no decision is made. It's just an opportunity for them to get early feedback. And that project, that process is actually pretty unique for Greenfield. Next slide. Sorry. So you still city council. <laughs> So this is, uh, we have these on our website. This is our typical timeline. It does change from time to time. We try to adjust um, our time frames as we're seeing. Um, it really is, um, it looks very complicated, um, but there's a lot of different processes occurring at the same time or overlapping. So again, our process starts with concept, gets an initial feedback on a proposal, and then moving into um, a more detailed development review process. Um, oftentimes, there's a little bit of overlap with the final engineering and building plan review. Um, if a project is feeling confident in their proposal, they'll submit those before they even have final approval from city council. Um, that's at their own risk. And I'll go more into detail um, in the next slides with that process. Next. Comes are hard to break. So um, pre-application is a step that I didn't really talk about but because this is um, a staff level review. This is where we really start. And um, you had your economic uh, vitality uh, forum. Where it was probably discussed about efforts that are made to attract businesses and interact with businesses that are interested in coming to Burfield. Pre-application is when those businesses first contact the community development department. We may get a few phone calls or an email, um, but this is really that first step where they're interested in sitting down with staff and talking about a proposal um, and really learning about our process. So typically staff attends um, from engineering and planning, and then we'll bring in others as necessary. So that could be traffic, could be North Metro needs to send a representative. Um, it could be economic vitality if it's a, if it's a larger project or involves um, one of our key areas like um, baseline or water crossing. We really talk about key initiatives of the city council. So this is where we can bring up things like the need for inclusive housing, um, the interest in sustainable building practices, this is where we talk about those, those, those elements that maybe don't come across in their zoning document. Um, oftentimes, the consultants have done their research. They know what their zoning is. They know what their PUD plan says. But this is their opportunity to hear from staff. What are the current desires of the community? Um, what are the city council's priorities? And hear that. So we provide that at this pre-application stage. The next step in the process, as I mentioned, was that concept review. And this really ranges. Um, it can be a very um, general proposal. Um, used to be say, stated, uh, sketched on the back of a napkin kind of idea. Um, just an, uh, an opportunity to get feedback. But oftentimes what the developing community finds is that the more details they provide, the better feedback they get, both from city council and from the community as a whole, because they want to present it as best they can to the community. This is that first opportunity often for the um, community to engage in the process and provide their own feedback. We provide notices to make sure that residents are aware that projects are in and how they can engage. They can provide their comments on with your voice, which we'll go into a little bit later, um, or at the meeting or by email. And then usually somewhere between these two, the pre-app and, and the next step, we also have a neighborhood meeting, which I don't have a slide for, um, but that's another opportunity for a developer to specifically engage um, with residents. Yeah. Um, does the city council have a chance to meet? Like I know Ziggy's coffee was in here just recently. Do they, does the city council have a chance to interact with them outside of the public meeting before the public meeting to ask questions? 
That's a great question. So um, it depends on where they are in the process. Oftentimes, uh, developers will reach out to city council. Um, some, one of the nice things about concept reviews, is they're able to present to all the council at one time. So we don't have a whole lot of requests. Um, but they can request before they, they enter the, uh, the site development by the PD process. Once they enter that period of time, it's a quasi-judicial process, and there can't be any discussions between city council or commissioners in the applicant. But before that time, they can have um, interactions. So um, during the concept review process, it could be that there is a conversation or um, council can attend neighborhood meetings because all of those occur um, before the formal application. So once that formal application comes in, the site development plan, final plat, PUD plan, um, we get a lot more detail. We'll get information on grading, traffic reports, utilities. Um, we get detailed information about architecture. Um, it goes out, probably a typical application goes to about 20 to 25 staff members. So that's internal and external. Um, Excel, United Power, um, adjacent cities, school districts, they would all get referrals depending on the type of project. So residential projects, for example, always go to the, to the school district um, that they're located in, but they wouldn't get a commercial project. Um, but United Power would, um, various city, uh, city departments review it, as well as North Metro Fire Rescue review, reviews um, nearly every project. So at, at this stage, we're looking at the comprehensive plan. Um, Brookfield has adopted many long-range planning documents that are focused on different areas. Um, and so we're looking at those guiding documents as well as the established PUD plan and the municipal code. Um, engineering is looking specifically at the standards and specs and looking at those preliminary and final engineering plans as those are submitted to make sure that they meet all of our standards. Um, and it's a and we also at this stage are looking at the public improvements that would be needed to serve the development and establishing an agreement that would be reviewed with these plans for how those public improvements would be installed. For example, um, does the road need to be widened? Or um, does a public park need to be built to, uh, to accommodate for a new neighborhood? Um, so we establish the timing and the level of improvements. Once it is um, meta reviewed, and, and I think I had on the other slide, it's about six to eight months. We at the month process because we go through multiple reviews with the development team. Um, and once we've addressed all of those technical issues, it moves into a public hearing process. Many of our projects go to both the Land Use Review Commission and City Council um, if they're over seven acres or involve any type of amendment to their zoning. Um, that's when we, when we see both City Council and Land Use involved. But smaller projects can be reviewed and approved by the Land Use Review Commission. Um, subject to final uh, call-up decision by the city council. Um, so public hearing is an opportunity for the public to continue to engage. They can speak at the meeting, they can submit their comments in advance. Um, and then the city council can take all of that information that's been presented by the applicant, by staff, um, and anything else that comes up during the public meeting um, to make a final decision. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question, obviously, with the um, LURC uh, being established, trying to become more efficient, cost effective in bringing projects uh, forward. Is there an average cost to the city per project in terms of the six to eight, nine month process? Uh, on average, the, the, the costs the city to, you know, with staff time and everything else. That's a good question. I don't have those numbers. It would be something we can look at. Um, in fact, um, our staff is currently doing research on fees um, and how it compares to other um, municipalities. Um, a fee for a site development plan is somewhere around $650 plus $15 an acre. Uh, nowhere near covering the amount of staff time. Where the revenue is, um, is achieved in development is at the other end. With um, once it's a, getting a building permit um, hold, I think our revenues last year um, or next year were projected over four million. So um, the fees that we charge do not cover the services provided through development review, um, but there if there are fees at the building permit stage that then um, uh, make up for that difference. 
But I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that information available. This um, flow chart, um, as was mentioned, that the change for having land use review commission um, being allowed to make those, some final decisions was a pretty recent change. Uh, it was implemented earlier this year. So this is the flow chart that we follow. And um, as it, it shows, there's a neighborhood meeting that is involved um, in the formal process. Uh, final decision is made, and the city council still has 14 days after that land use review commission decision to decide whether to call it up for further review. And it doesn't mean that the city council calls up a decision because they disagree with it, but it could be that they would like to hear more about it. They would like another opportunity if there was a lot of public engagement for continued engagement, um, and they can decide, you know, the same decision as land use review, um, or, or or change the decision or condition it somehow um, in the last roughly six months. Um, I don't think that we had any of our projects called up by the Land Use Review Commission. Um, and this, uh, the projects that are reviewed by the commission are relatively small. They're under seven acres, um, things like a drive-through restaurant addition, or um, I think the example was Ziggy's car wash, something like that, not car wash, Ziggy's car wash. <laughs> With that scale would be something that um, could potentially be reviewed by land use review if it doesn't have a PD amendment process. And even with all of that done, if they get a final approval by land use um, or city council, um, there's still additional steps that need to be taken in order to ensure that the project is safe, um, meeting all of our engineering standards uh, and building codes. So those final reviews occur after primarily after the city council's approval. Um, so those are construction drawings, building permit issuance, and then the, of course the inspection process. Um, Katie mentioned that occurs both for the infrastructure um, as well as the building itself. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that Ziggy's Coffee, it was in the Jefferson County PUD, is that correct? Um, how come, was that not annexed by Broomfield? And we how, how did we get involved with that if it's Jefferson? County. It, it is actually in city and county of Broomfield, but it oddly put Jefferson County in the name of the planned unit oh. development district. Okay. Um, but we do have some areas that retained zoning from the counties um, when they were brought in. So the Wilcox neighborhood is a good example of that, where north of 144th Avenue between um, Wall and Zunai, there is an area with what we call A1A zoning. So it's an agricultural zoning from Adams County, and it's frozen in time from the time that they were annexed. We don't enforce Adams County zoning, just zoning ordinance as it is today. We enforce it as it was at the time of their annexation, <coughs> unless modified by Brookfield. So there are some areas that are like that. Yes, Sienna, would you mind if we just, just so that everybody knows, talk about that we can and can how we cannot annex. Um, since you've used that term a couple of times, and that's sure, that's a great question. Here. So the, the question for the um, those listening was um, how and can Brookfield annex? And there is a process for annexation, but it is cost prohibitive and complicated. It would involve um, votes with all um, of the counties that were involved in the creation of Brookfield. So it's very cost prohibitive. Um, effectively, it means we can't annex additional property. So when I was mentioning the um, somewhere around 34 acres, acres square miles of Brookfield, um, that is really what we have to work with and why it's so incredibly important for us to have a comprehensive plan that outlines our vision, um, of a large focus on our economic vitality and our financial health moving forward because that acreage um, really is what we have for the long term. So um, this presentation will be linked online. Um, and when it is, these are live links to help facilitate um, getting to some additional information. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of times the development community and our citizens look to our website first. Um, we, we love it if they call and, and want to talk to us or send us an email and let us know their questions, but oftentimes people do want to seek out that information on their own, so we really try to have a robust website. Um, we have some online maps. Uh, Katie had mentioned the active CIP project map. We also have a planning and engineering map to help look for projects. Um, planning has a current project list that is very helpful. 
Um, and then some other online resources, um, looking at building permits, all of those are online. We also keep monthly reports, um, which are very interesting and show the continued um, de development that we're seeing in Broomfield um, Municipal Code and our engineering standards and specs are also available. And then our big online engagement tool that we really um, jumped into during the pandemic and found it very successful is the Birth and Voice. Um, so development proposals, as they get started through our process at concept review stage, have a website built. And these are all housed at birthofvoice.com under development proposals. And uh, the community can see the applications. We link to all of the application documents. So if you're interested in a traffic study, you've got access to it. Um, if you want to see the landscape plan, you've got access to it right from the start. Um, so that six to eight month process, these websites are live that whole time um, and we build onto it. Um, you can see our comment letters, all of it's available on that website in the, the links. And um, there's an opportunity there on the website to engage. You can provide comments and read others' comments, um, or you can obviously provide comments by email too or attend the public meetings. Um, however, um, is desired. But we really find that having these online resources um, helps to make sure that our development community has the best knowledge when they're coming in to present a proposal and get started. Um, and we find it's very valuable for our residents to have access to all of this information, not just the couple of days before the first public hearing, but really as it's moving through the process. The nat next natural question is, well, how do people know about the Bird Voice? Um, and we do that through a number of means starting with uh, the neighborhood meeting or the community or the concept review, whichever happens to come first. We do mailings to property owners um, and tenants, renters um, within a thousand feet. Um, we reach out to um, online via the Nextdoor app. Um, we can post to Nextdoor and let people know that application is there. We can't really engage through Nextdoor, um, but it, we find that it's very it's a great way to let people know that there's an application. Um, we also have signs that get posted on the property. Um, so we really try to provide a wide variety of opportunities to reach folks and know, let them know that something is coming through the process. Um, and then that Birdfield voice page, once it's built, um, if people are interested in the project, we include key dates there as well. So they can know when it's potentially proposed to go to land use review, city council, um, if a neighborhood meeting is scheduled. So, uh, Brentfield Voice is a great resource. Um, really happy that it's um, really been a, such an effective tool for us. So, I wanted to quick touch on some very high level things that we're seeing interest in in the development community. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in multifamily development. This is typically rental. Um, Condo development is um, growing. We have Century communities, which will be developing and interlocking with some condos, um, but it remains difficult in Colorado. And uh, I think we have a new project coming into baseline as well, um, potentially with some condo development. But it is primarily rental. We see a lot of small lot single families. So this could be townhomes or detached um, single family. Um, this is low maintenance. Um, it's because it's small lots. Um, it provides an attainable option and really it provides some diversification of our housing. Um, because if you think of some of our historic areas with Burnville Heights, Westlake, Broadlands, um, these are homes on larger lots. So the smaller lot development um, is helping to diversify our options moving forward. We're also continuing to see lot splits up in places like the Wilcox neighborhood. And we're seeing a growing interest in accessory dwelling units. So that's adding um, a space that's rentable in your basement or in a detached structure. Um, that was really important to our um, housing advisory committee a few years ago, and they worked on um, having an ordinance reviewed and adopted. Um, and so we do see some interest in that as well. So we have three key areas. Um, I don't know if this was brought up at our economic vitality discussion, but um, we have three key areas where we're seeing a lot of development or, or we really have great projects coming forward. The baseline development up in Northern Brookville, around Colorado 7 and I-25. We have flat iron crossings redevelopment that's already been mentioned a few times today. And then we have the project here at Brookville Town Square. And with all of these, you'll see this interest in a higher density project than projects that are um, surrounding it, like um, 
Brookfield Heights in the case of Brookfield Town Square or um, Anthem to baseline is a, a change in density. But again, it's it's a it's a matter of finding that new opportunity, supporting the commercial development. Um, it's walkable, it's sustainable, and it's attainable. And that's providing a different opportunity for housing within Brookfield. And then the commercial side, again, lots of mixed use interest. Um, which is part of that sustainability, being able to um, live and work in the same area helps to reduce traffic. Um, it is what we're seeing with Brookfield Town Square, Ladder Crossing, and Baseline. Um, it does make for a complex development and why the Matrix team is so critical. Um, so these are also adding, we're also seeing a lot of interest in adding residential to our commercial areas. And because Brookfield is locked at 34 square acres, looking at that very critically and understanding how that impacts our financial long-term viability. We're also seeing a lot of interest in flex space. So that's light industrial focus. So it could be manufacturing, um, research and development, um, some warehouses, and we're seeing some distribution as well. And then experiential retail is probably where we'll hopefully see some interest. Um, and then infill development and redevelopment. So 120th Avenue corridor um, really even flood arm crossing is, is fitting that as well. So um, those are some trends that we're seeing um, right now with our applications or our interest that really is supported by a lot of our um, efforts um, with sustainability inclusionary housing um, and our economic vitality. So with that, I will uh, open it up to some more questions. You know, the um, accessory dwelling obviously relieves some of the pressure on units availability right, and affordable housing. Uh, I've had folks over at Rootville Heights though that are very concerned about the impact on um, you know, streets and traffic and parking and all that. So I just wonder uh, how how well versed we are in respect to the actual impacts that that has on a neighborhood. That's a great question. I think the city council did a lot of careful consideration of that as they looked at the ordinance. So when we adopted our accessory dwelling ordinance, um, I believe it was about two years ago, um, there was a lot of interest in how do we ensure that there is not too much um, infill that it changes the character of the neighborhood. Um, so one of the things that they did was they had limited the size of accessory dwelling units and also occupancy. Um, and those two things together, um, we really feel are going to help to alleviate that. There's also limitations on where it can be placed on the lot. Um, and all of those things together, although we're seeing interest in it, we're not having hundreds of applications flooding our door. Um, it really is a small trickle that's coming through and maybe it will grow as time comes in. Um, but a lot of um, a lot of what we're hearing is it, it, it works that that the limitations work, but it does it ensures that you can't have two of the same size structures on the line. You really don't have um, it's not a doubling of the density on the same lot. So. Follow on question to that. Uh, it seems like there's less activity or less visibility for uh, the preserve first filing. Are you aware of their concerns? And is is it just the passage of time? Or I know there's a, a couple of things that aren't on the table anymore that may have alleviated some of that community concern. So the, sorry if you can clarify the visibility of it in terms of well the you know a couple of years ago there was signs on you know maybe a third of the of the properties and there's a lot less of that and it just seems like it's not as uh, front of mind for folks in the neighborhood as it was a year or two ago. The sorry the. For the Brookfield Square development? No, just, I think just in general, the, the sense of, of community and um, historic preservation, if you will, that mid century kind of suburban neighborhood feel that a lot of the folks over there, you know, they, they were drawn to that some of them many years ago and they don't want that to change. And of course, uh, the, the center will affect that and 
uh, accessory building and its effect that and you know anytime we're looking at making a change obviously change could look like it's a lot different than what one is used to so um i just wondered if you have a sense of how much um uh, concern or focus there is from that kind of a constituency in that part of town I think the, the signs that we saw a few years ago were really focused on potential redevelopment um, for, the, I think, the Nativity Church site. Yeah. Um, and, and since that hasn't moved forward, um, that is one reason, at least I think, that we're not seeing a lot of the signs. Many years ago, there was actually a neighborhood uh, plan that was created for um, for first filing. And we have development standards in our code even to help protect the um, neighborhood. Now that is only first filing. That's the area south of Midway. Doesn't extend north of Midway into second filing. Um, but those things are, um, for example, if someone were to build a detached structure, it needs to have some masonry on it. If they remove a tree, they have to replace the tree. There's further constraints on the size of accessory structures in the first filing than there are in any other established neighborhood. So, and, and we have this neighborhood plan that also was created to help to envision that. Um, we do have a historic landmark board. Um, and so they haven't, um, they're not seeking out a historic designation for the neighborhood or something like that, but that would be the mechanism if someone was interested in learning more about historic preservation or in efforts in historic preservation for both field to um, attend those board meetings or to get information on their upcoming projects. Um, I think those are probably the big things that we're seeing. Hopefully we're seeing continued engagement from the neighborhood. Um, there's another neighborhood meeting for uh, Burnfield Town Square, I believe, uh, tomorrow night. So we really try to encourage the residents in the area to help provide us feedback. Um, there's been a few over the years, um, definitely opportunities for them to continue to give us um, information and, and how that interfaces because you're right, it is a different thing. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Um, okay. Uh, the condos, you said they're difficult, and I've heard that from other people. And why is that? So there's protections, and I'm not an expert in this at all, but um, there are protections for um, construction defects. And the liability for the construction of condominiums is different than apartments. So it's less likely for a developer to be want to take that on rather than um, a resident of uh, an apartment. And, and I think Jeff heard my call for help on this one and he's helping me out here because he's definitely probably got more um, details on why that does not work. So I am the phone your friend um, for, this, for this question. Um, so construction defects set aside by Colorado law, there's a liability look back on for sale housing that's done in multifamily. It's a seven year look back period. What that does is it means that residents either individually or collectively can sue um, the developer or the builder of that, the developer, the builder, and the designer, and um, get damages for any construction defects. What that does is it adds increased liability. There's estimates that it's somewhere between eighty to one hundred thousand dollars per unit. So what that means in all of Colorado, it's had a chilling effect on condo development. You will see condos come forward, uh, both here in Broomfield and other places, when they're in the price range of eight hundred thousand or more. So condos traditionally have been that first home buyer kind of option. Here in Colorado, it's just not worked out. There have been uh, multiple efforts to get legislation to improve that because it needs to be done through the legislature. And both parties at different times have stood against some of the legislation that's been proposed. So it's neither a Republican or Democrat issue, it's a kind of a collective issue. Um, and the most recent revision occurred roughly two years ago. And I think not the set, not this last session, but the session before. Um, but it still has not had an opening effect. Is that because of the design of a condo versus a townhome, or what's what's different? It, it's, it, it just has a characteristic that's unique in the sense of when you have an apartment, there's a single owner of it, and they can make those improvements, and they are effectively, oftentimes, the, the developer or the owner of it, and so they'll take responsibility for it. In a condo, it's shared ownership, and so some of those common areas, like the, the outsides and some of those other things, it's a way you have shared ownership so it affects it in a different manner 
So it is not necessarily the building itself. Okay. But one of the proposals that went forward, which is very difficult to do, is to couple the liability as a singular group. So the only people that effectively are able to build a building very, very well here is when you have somebody that does architecture, construction, and ownership all in one. Generally speaking, most common developer these days, you'll have an architect who will design it, you'll have an owner who's paying for it, and you'll have a general contractor who's building it. And those things don't always perfectly line up. And so the architect and the general contractor will sometimes have conversations. So when Katie was talking about like the CIP role, that's effectively what we're trying to do is, is be the middle people to make sure that that works out well and to make sure that the contractors in the particular case of the building, we're making sure that as the owner, we're talking to them very directly. That's not as easy to do when you kind of develop. If you want to go more than that, I'm going to stop here. And there are experts and lawyers and others who have spent seemingly now years trying to understand this and trying to find a solution. It's just we haven't gotten there yet. Thank you. With the importance uh, this community has placed on affordable housing, what are the key hangups? It seems to me we should be able to zone and, and and rezone potentially to accommodate directly for those types of developments, whether it's smaller footprint housing uh, or, or maybe a more mixed development around smaller footprints. Can you just share maybe some of your thoughts in the department as, as to what are the key hangups as to why these projects haven't moved forward? And we've been having this conversation for a long time. So the, the way I will start that is that um, my world moves very slowly. So um, it feels like a long time with nothing coming out of the ground, but we have been talking for a long time and things have been happening in the background. So we're gonna start to see some really exciting projects coming out. We have Academy Place here on 120 that's getting built, um, Northwest Apartments on that's kind of at the end of the Northwest Parkway. Um, we have the Dillon Point project that's bringing in some um, attainable for sale products, as well as Lennar is building some up in Northern Burnfield. So with the ordinance that was passed by the city and county, uh, the city council a few years ago, it takes a while for these projects to actually then make it through the process and adhere to those new requirements. So the ordinance that was passed says that new developments should provide cash and lieu equivalent to 10% um, um, uh, or let's see, 20% at at 60% AMI for um, rental, and I'm looking at Jeff to make sure I get these right, and 10% of the for sale projects at 80% AMI. And so they, <coughs> the developers can provide cash in lieu, which is what the ordinance says, but what we really want is the units. We really highly encourage that. We start with that at the pre-application stage. So before they're even a real application, um, they're hearing that from staff, they're hearing that from the housing team, um, they're hearing that a lot. Um, so we have a lot of projects that are moving through the process, but that ordinance took effect. And then these projects start to make their way through. Um, there's the acquiring of the land, the entitlements through zoning, um, and then that construction space. So we are starting to see it. Um, in terms of um, Broomfield taking on that next step, some of that is acquiring these funds. So we have a lot of developers that are providing the cash in and those checks are starting to be submitted to the, the housing um, group. There's a discussion regarding uh, forming an independent housing authority, which would then be taking those funds and potentially determining how to utilize them. And potentially that is something um, where they are acquiring land and moving forward with the project. There's also, um, your project included kind of an element of, what about making sure that projects include a smaller footprint, smaller lots, um, and we are seeing more of that with projects like baseline, where the projects do have a smaller footprint and a smaller lot. Um, and that really does help to achieve a more attainable um, price point um, than we could otherwise. It also helps to, like I said before, diversify what our housing options are. Um, a house in, in one subdivision that's you know south of Rogers Parkway is significantly different than what uh, baseline is building, but they're trying to appeal to very different buyers. So that's great. That helps to diversify who's coming to work. Yeah, and I appreciate that that response. I, I guess in terms of uh, actual affordable housing, because we are we're talking about attainable more so on some smaller footprints. 
Um, it, is it reasonable to think that we are going to have uh, an 80 user piece of this, but standalone housing that may be 650, 1,000 square feet, 1,200 square feet? Because we're not seeing those projects, even on those smaller footprints, we're still seeing you know, the McMansions. <laughs> we are. And you know, some of the other cities, uh, you know, I, I do follow what, what our neighbors have um, occurring and the cottage stuff type development or tiny houses. Um, we haven't had a lot of interest in that yet by any developer, um, but we would open that up. The opportunity is there with the way that Birdfield does um, PUD zoning, that if there was there was ever a city that could accommodate that, um, it's here. It would just have to be the right location. It has to be, you know, the right density, the way that it works with the neighborhood, the traffic has to work. Um, but those projects can be very well done and well received, but we haven't had interest in that yet. Um, so the cash in lieu housing or cash in lieu that the developers provide, um, does that go to help the lower income people and then because I'm thinking that if you provide lower housing prices for one part of the neighborhood, then the other part will have to pay for it. So does the cash in lieu provide the foundation for those lower users? Do you understand what I'm saying? Totally. I am just going to let Jeff take this. Um, <laughs> the, housing, uh, the housing advisory committee is, is with his department, so I just want to okay. You look like you're interested in this one. <laughs> um, so again, Jeff Romine, I'm the, I've got all kinds of titles, but director of academic vitality sometimes, or, um, but as Anna pointed out, collectively, several of us kind of share the housing world, if you will. So we each have a, an element of the answer we're closely together. So first off is the cash and lieu fee is paid upon building permit issuance. Um, so that's when it comes in. And so it's something that Anna's Partly, Anna's team is, is controlling to some degree at that, that point when the, the permit is issued. Once that does, it's deposited in their general fund account. That money is then utilized and reserved to be create additional affordable housing. And so it really is about creating that 60% AMI housing or below, or 80% housing for sale or below. And that's where we're using some of the funds to subsidize those activities. Um, and so you've heard some of those projects or will have heard some of those projects coming forward and we're putting dollars in to support some of that to offset some of the costs. The other thing that city council did to support affordable housing was is they put some expectations in around the waivers um, for fees that are being paid for to the city. Not the water and sewer fee, but some of the review fees and other things will be waived for projects that include affordable housing. Um, and so it's a proportionality of those fees. It's not a 100% fees necessarily. If it were 100% affordable, it's something that we would consider. So that's how it works. Um, going back then to Grayson's question, if I could, just for a second, and that is, is, as you can imagine, when you're bringing forward and trying to figure out how to create affordable housing, whether it be for sale or rental, there are certain fixed costs that are related to an individual unit. Um, so the way that is an example are water fees, and David's the expert at it, and so I'll muddle through this and he will frown at me through his mask if I screw this up, but our water fee, our license fee to that is related to whether it's a multifamily or single family, and it's a different um, amount of, of fee uh, determined on that. What you're asking for, Grayson, is, is if we went to tiny homes as an example, Therefore, in a smaller lot, would we do something? And I think what we're at right now is that we don't have something set up in that way. What we are trying to do, part of the reason for creating an independent Broomfield Housing Authority, is to start thinking creatively about how can we encourage more development around some of these priority issues like affordable housing. And so, what we may be doing going forward on any particular aspect of it, how we may be supporting it whether through fixed costs or changing land ownership or whatever, maybe uh, the housing authority would own the land and grant a 99 release. Those types of creative solutions to solving some of these difficult fixed cost problems are what we're going to be exploring in the next few years. Does that help and answer both sets of questions? Yeah, actually, that was, that was really helpful. I, I guess just as one kind of more addendum to that question, then it, it, so in some of my conversations with developers here locally, one of the the big concerns is well the city hasn't actually come forward and said we are zoning for 
for these smaller communities, or we're, we're zoning, uh, uh, you know, for this more affordable type of product. Uh, and on top of that, you mentioned the water, the, the water taps or the you know, sewer fees. So, you know, it, if the city were able to come forward with some sort of uh, proposition as to uh, reduce costs for that type of development or specific zoning for that type of development, I've heard that there is demand there. And so <clears throat> it's kind of the chicken or the egg, I guess. But um, at the end of the day, um, I, I, I guess I want to know that we're we're working toward that. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just conclude and then turn it back over to Anna. But yes, we collectively all hear city council's priorities and the community's priorities. And as professionals, we have to live within the rules we currently have sure. and the approaches we currently have. But we are researching, advocating, and thinking through what those might be and being prepared to be able to respond to questions from council or city management. Perfect. Thank you. I'm for up here. Um, so um, last year, um, or actually maybe it was earlier this year, we, we have a new member of our planning team. We have an urban designer that just um, joined our team. And, and that person's uh, primary effort is currently to help to create a toolbox. Um, and that toolbox is, is intended to help provide developers with, we might not be out there rezoning someone's property because Burnfield wouldn't want to go in and forcibly rezone, but we do want to have a toolbox available. We want to have, what do we mean by um, a tiny house community? What would our expectations be? So that urban um, planner is looking at what our city policies are, um, our existing documents, our comprehensive plan, the economic vitality matrix, and then we'll be coming up with some guidelines so that when developers do come to us and have land that they're interested in, they can more easily understand what it is that they would need to do in order to achieve it. Great, thank you. Additional questions? Well, we really appreciate you being here. And I'm not sure if Abby wants to do some quick closing remarks. Thank you. Just super quick, just want to remind everybody, you know, if you know folks that were interested in participating in Code In, um, these videos are up online so folks can actually watch um, the interaction and see the questions live. Um, we also have the presentations up um, on the Camden information site. So Broomfield.org is it backslash? I always get the slash wrong. Elections. So Broomfield.org, I'm gonna go with backslash elections. Um, so that way if people want to look at those after. And if you have questions, email CMO crew at Broomfield.org. So again, CMO crew at Broomfield.org and we can follow up. So we appreciate you guys attending and Hopefully we're getting some really nice rain out there. So have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat>